thoughts. I All can't right. find the chat. All right. Well, uh, okay. So this week's uh, chapter was about uh, functions, and it's kind of the first in a couple chapters about functions that I I think are uh, pretty pretty exciting. Um, and by the end, I think we'll be able to write our own functions for other people to use. Uh, let's see. Uh, so just the basics that I think all of us are aware of, um, you know, functions uh, do things to objects. They uh, operate on them in some way. And I guess the terminology is that a function has a parameter. So in this case, like for the sum function, the parameter that I've highlighted is NARM. Uh, and so parameters specify what, you know, what the inputs are, and they can be either named like NARM or unnamed. Um, in this case, the first argument to the sum function is unnamed. It's, it's, if you look at the help file, it's just uh, an ellipses. And so that can be uh, like an arbitrary uh, number of, uh, of inputs. Uh, and so, any, so the, the uh, matching uh, sort of pair to the parameter is the argument. So the argument is like the concrete thing that you're passing to the parameter. So in this case, uh, the argument to NARM is false, or the argument to the first uh, parameter in sum is uh, the uh, vector one, two, three. Um, and so it's important to know how to read the help files in, uh, in the uh, R kind of help file repository. And I think we all know this already, but so here's an example of the help file for paste. Um, and you know, the actual file has has a lot of uh, description, but if you just look at the first line, it will give you this uh, this example of paste. And so the the important thing to know is that the default arguments are listed. So the default argument to the collapse parameter is null. The default argument to the recycle zero parameter is false. Uh, the default argument to the sep parameter is, is uh, one white space. Um, and then there's no default argument to these, these uh, ellipses uh, unnamed argument. It, could, it can take an un arbitrary number of the specified inputs. So we do that with paste all the time. We have like, you know, paste three different vectors together and, and uh, apply the other arguments. Uh, and I mean, also, I think we all already know this, but, you know, maybe for the benefit of the the YouTube uh, recording, uh, uh, how you order the arguments depends on how they're listed in the help file. So with paste, uh, if you don't want to name any of the arguments when you're pa passing them to the function, you, you can follow the order strictly that's given in the help file. So in the first case, uh, paste A, uh, B, null does, uh, you know, like paste A and B are, uh, are satisfying this uh, ellips ellipses uh, parameter, and then null is uh, going to collapse, and then the other two are just uh, going following their defaults. Um, but if you want to mix up the order, you can. You just have to name the parameter. So in this case, you can specify collapse first if you want, but you just have to name the parameter and then and then give the argument. Um, so that's just you know that's just very basic stuff. Uh, custom functions can be defined in a couple different ways. Uh, so you always kind of, you'll name them and use the assignment operator. So in the, in the example on this slide, the name is func. Um, uh, and then, so the kind of uh, syntactical th uh, thing here with defining these custom functions is that you can uh, leave off these curly brackets if you if your function consists of only one expression, so in this case, on the first bullet point on this side, you have function uh, x x plus one, and so that's like a valid function definition. But if you have multiple expressions in a uh, function, you need to use these uh, curly brackets uh, to uh, sort of uh, which basically tells the parser to execute all the expressions in that. Uh, I don't want to say environment, but in in that list of uh, of, of functions. It's not a it's not a list in the technical sense, but in, in the casual sense. Um, and I also think even if you don't need the curly brackets, my opinion is that they generally make uh, things easier to read. So I think I, I would probably use them all the time. I thought, uh, so, oh, I, thought, 
reading this section was so funny because I just like have always known that you need curly brackets but to make a function but never actually questioned like why curly yeah. brackets oh that's just the function format and to know that it means that it has to evaluate as one expression just like makes so much sense and that's I think what I really am enjoying about this book of, of like filling in the holes of why this actually makes sense not just this is the way things are yeah. And also I, I had pretty much only ever used curly brackets in that context, I think. And so it's, and, you know, like we don't have to use them that way. You can use them to do other stuff. Um, so yeah, that, that's, uh, interesting. Um, uh, and so one last thing, I, I don't, I don't know that this is in the book cause I think it's, it's a relatively new addition to R, but if you want to define a custom function, um, in an anonymous way, so you don't want to name it, you can use this new shorthand, which is uh, backslash X. Um, and so, you know, X is the, you, you know, you can have as many variables as you want between the parentheses and there'll be all the variables that you pass to your custom functions. Um, and so that's, you know, somewhat I, useful. I don't think it's on the book, but it's not that new. <laughs> well, yeah, it's not. Yeah, I guess he just has, maybe he doesn't uh, like it. Maybe he doesn't like, like it. Just one point to be careful, like the function or turn the last expression. It's work on your previous slide because it's X plus one, it is gonna update X, right. that is gonna update X the yeah. return. But it could lead to some like tricky stuff. Uh, yeah, and yeah, that's it. And uh, yeah, the curly braces like use them also in the if else statement. Mm, that's true, yeah. So that's, that's yeah. like the, mm -hmm. they contain an expression. I think that's makes yeah. it coherent, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that, that I, was, I was also like, uh, I mean, I, I, I learned that before, but yeah, it was also some, something that surprised me. Like, yeah, you could write like this function X, X plus one is totally valuable. valuable. Yeah. And it makes sense because sometimes you write uh, in L apply, you write a function, a custom function, mm -hmm. and then you just do this kind of stuff in one line. But yeah, just like yeah. it's good understanding way. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good point. And I, I should have mentioned that. Uh, yeah, when you're doing the, the by the default, I guess, behavior is that the last expression gets returned by a function. Yeah. You can also explicitly set what gets returned with a function called return. Um, and the One argument of my is previous boss was like, and I still keep that like, was even if not needed, write a return. So it's make cut. I mean, on our point of view, easier to read. Um, there's prime con. I'm still doing it because like sometimes I'm stupid and I forget this is the last expression that is yeah. called. So the return kind of helped me thinking that way. But uh, yeah, it's dependent on what you are doing, I guess. Yeah, Some I actually people... prefer that way as well. But I, I mostly see people not using return. Um, but I, I actually think it's, I don't know, I, to me it seems like a good practice just because it, it's, I mean, I, yeah, it's, more it's hard to know. Like I'm not good enough yeah. to know, but yeah. yeah. I, I know people have strong opinion on that. I do not, but yeah. <laughs> I particularly think that if you're working in a group and like sharing code back and forth, it is just, it's kind to include the return statement so it's clear what's coming out of it because evaluating someone else's crazy function that they may or may not have documented well is such a pain. So I, I always include it when I'm coding for anyone more than just me forever. And yeah, even I think it's a good point, me, especially with Pipe. You know, like when you are piping yeah. to piping to piping and you are not even sure like what you are returning. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, 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 I guess we all agree. Maybe we should all do that. Um, oh, and so here's a, an alternative way to call a function is to use this function uh, do call. And uh, kind of the main benefit of calling a function in this way where you don't have to uh, specify the name of the function beforehand. So you can uh, allow uh, the function to be called dynamically in response to like some user defined parameter or maybe it, like the result of some other process or, or whatever. Um, and so you, you can uh, you can do that using do call the function name as the first argument. And then the, the second argument is a, a list of the parameters that you want to pass to the, the call function. So that's pretty useful actually. Um, Okay, so the the kind of the meat of the chapter is about these higher order functions. Um, and we only really in the book cover map, uh, but some of the other ones are reduce uh, and filter, which I, I guess he kind of leaves for us to explore 
du on our du own. Ca counts also, I guess. Also. Count? Do call. The do call function. Like... Oh, yeah, do call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's true. Um, so I'll, I'll focus on map, I guess. Uh, and, you know, it's really useful. I, I had, before reading this chapter, uh, tended to prefer uh, the per package, the tidyverse per package, which has its own version of the map function. But actually, after doing this, I think I might prefer uh, the base the base map because it's pretty flexible. Um, so uh, map is, you know, and, and conceptually pretty simple, I'd say. It just applies a function to each element uh, of X and returns a list. That's the result of applying uh, that function to each element. So the simple way to think about it is that, uh, you know, the first element in the list is going to be f of x uh, element one. The second element in the list is going to be f of x element two, and so on and so forth. Um, and so I just did a little example. I I can't remember if this is from. Yeah, this is one of the exercises. Um, I think one of the exercises asked us. I forget the number of the exercise, but it asked us to uh, implement a simple version of the filter function using map. So here we see that. Um, you know, it's just like super, super simple, but uh, do uh, you you pass a function f to map, you pass a uh, object x, and then I actually used ellipses in case the function, since uh, we're implementing filter, maybe filter, we want to have some additional kind of arguments to pass to the filter function. So I, I left the ellipses in there. Um, and you can see if you, you know, use this uh, as an example, I just used this anonymous function x is greater than five and applied it to this uh, vector of uh, numbers between one and a hundred, and then used my simple filter, and uh, they all got they all got uh, uh, filtered, as it were. Um, so yeah, that is just a simple example of uh, of map, and I can't, I can't remember which exercise, but it's one of the earlier exercises. Um, okay, so kind of the, the cool thing about map uh, compared to all the other members of the apply family, and I think I, yeah, I have, I have the other ones later, but um, map allows you to specify which uh, arguments you want to vectorize and which ones you don't. So that's, that's kind of the cool feature of map. So uh, any arguments that you want to be vectorized, you uh, get past to this ellipses parameter so you don't you don't um, name them but you just you just uh, insert them after the function but and in any arguments that you don't want to be vectorized you pass to this more args parameter and the form that that argument takes is a list of um, further parameters and arguments so like it could be list um you know narm equals true or whatever um, and that would be a common one actually because you don't usually need to vectorize that uh, and it also works on uh, anonymous and uh, and custom functions and always returns a list. Um, so that that's and that was kind of I think like the heart of this chapter is is teaching us uh, about wh which arguments kind of getting to pay attention to which ones we want to vectorize and which ones we don't want to vectorize. That's kind of the the core of the chapter. Um, and just to kind of uh, bring this into uh, kind of starker, uh, I, I think he, I, we should make this more explicit than he did. Um, and I hope this is correct, but so uh, map is part of this apply family of functions, which um, I think we're mostly familiar with lapply, which uh, uh, returns a list um, in the same way that map does. That's why it's called like l apply, list apply, I guess. Um, uh, but the kind of deal with l apply is that it can iterate over one variable only. Um, and so m apply and map can iterate over multiple variables at once. And so the reason map I think is preferred is that m apply is actually the multiple multivariate version of s apply. And so s apply is like l apply, but it tries to simplify the output to a vector. Um, so m apply will try to simplify the output to a vector if it can. Um, I, I think that. I actually don't prefer that behavior. I think I agree with the author that that uh, I think I prefer to have a, uh, a list and, and to handle the simplification by myself. So map can take multiple arguments and, and returns a list. So it's kind of like the multi uh, variant version of L apply, I guess. Um, and it's, so it's like the most flexible of these of this family of apply functions. 
Um, oops, hello. Um, uh, uh, so yeah, so uh, I'm gonna go through a couple of the applications that the exercise demonstrate. Um, and the first one is this really simple one, which is just to vectorize un, uh, functions that aren't already vectorized. And so uh, the exercise that I picked to illustrate this was exercise 7.13, which focuses on the find interval function. Um, I guess I repeated a bullet there, but uh, so in the find interval function, uh, there's two arguments. One is X, which is vectorized. And then the second one is this VEC argument, which is not vectorized. It's uh, a vector that defines the intervals um, uh, that, uh, that X gets sorted into. Uh, but, you know, this exercise 7.13 basically asks, like, okay, write a version of this function that uh, that uh, can take a vectorized argument uh, in this second argument, too. Uh, so you can pass uh, a vector of x's and then a vector of intervals, basically. Um, so this is just doing that. Um, there's we, I use this stop. Uh, you see in lines... Uh, Three and four, I use the stop argument, um, which stops the execution of a function if some of the inputs are uh, not, not what you expect. So in this case, A has to be uh, less than B because it, it's the beginning of the interval. Uh, and then we're using a anonymous uh, function that's really just a, a version of find interval. So we have to use an anonymous function because we want to have A and B, uh, B to, we want to be able to pass A and B individually to uh, the find interval function and to vectorize both of them um, like ind independently. But um, if that wasn't the case, we, we could we wouldn't have to use an anonymous function. Uh, and then yeah, so then uh, yeah, so here's here's the result of that. You can see like it works in the simple case um, where we in this first uh, code block, we don't have a vectorized in uh, B because we just have a scalar inputs, but it does work with uh, vectors in the A and B arguments in the second code block. So we can, so basically it's uh, checking X against the interval one to 10, and then checking X against the interval 10 through 100, and then it's recycling. So it's going back to one through 10, you know, so it's kind of a silly demonstration, I guess, but uh, okay. So another example that we are kind of comes out in exercise 7.14 is to vectorize over multiple inputs. And I guess that's kind of what we just did, but I, I'm trying to find a way to, to incorporate, you know, the, the exercises here. Um, so uh, in this case, we have this uh, uh, function. What, what does this do? I can't even remember. Um, uh, oh, it just duplicates uh, the, uh, an input character, the specified number of times. So this is just a simple case of, uh, of vectorizing uh, the arguments to, to paste and the arguments to uh, to rep, repeat. Um, and so yeah, this this one's uh, you know relatively simple. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know that there's a ton to explain here, but you can see that the key is that we're vectorizing over both. Uh, the argument x and the argument times. I will say that also Corey has recently helped me do these in my work in real life, not just exercises, because I have found that coming from Python, um, using map and whatnot, it is like the hardest thing for me to shift mindset wise. Like I'm so used to writing loops that I'm like what like what is map like I, I've just it's been hard to get it into my head and I've needed to vectorize some non-vectorized functions uh, over single inputs and multiple inputs so Corey and I have been working on this at IRL as well no it's it's good like it was trendy like you know 10 years ago mm -hmm. uh, people were all about match readers because um, BigQuery has an implementation of it uh -huh. but that's not exactly the same I mean that's close but uh, so no, it's like, um, yeah, I guess Python is all about iter and stuff like that, but, um, you can, I, I'm sure like Python have a map version also. Right. But I just like have always used loops because like, that's what you do. Uh, <laughs> Python. It's, uh, it's, in some code, it can be fine. No worries, but it's good. Like, uh, practicing, I guess. Right. No, but it's been, that has been like. That and piping has been like the main like uh, mindset shifts that I've had to make coming from Python to R, and I'm I'm slowly but surely getting there. Yeah, no worry. Like, uh, 
Yeah, it, it took time. Uh, I, that's good that you have done a lot of exercise. I was like, I have done the very easy exercise in the book, like the chapter, they are super easy. Like they are not even worth mentioning, I feel like. But yeah. You know, and well, I mean, I don't know. We'll have to talk about it eventually, I think. But like as as we get further into the book, like some of these chapters have a ton of exercises. Like the I think that does not have. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't have. But, but then yeah. some of some of them have like 40 exercises. Yeah, maybe, not do, so, maybe not do all of them. The one yeah. you pick, I think, are a good one. Designing, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Designing functions, which is in two chapters, not the next one, but well, after that, has like 40 something. And the chapter itself is just really long. Uh, so I, maybe we'll split that one into multiple. Yeah. yeah. Or I wonder if we should split the exercises like among ourselves or something, like each of us does a third, or I don't know, just so it's, that we don't. It's a good question. Know. It's a good question. Yeah. Like, uh, I don't know. I think like a lot of this exercise, you know, the kind of fill a uh, coding question. Yeah. They are good to do because like they help you like review what you have seen. For example, like uh, the the first one, the first exercise at the end of the chapter is always kind of the gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't know if you will touch that letters, but some of it I'm still unsure. Yeah, I have that. We, I mean, maybe we could do that. Now. Okay, let, let, let's um, do that. Then. But let yeah, me see. I, I just wanted to say, like, yeah, some people code, some people tend to use base R, some people tend to use tidyverse, and sometimes they mix it. <laughs> yeah. So be ready to see both. Like, I, I'm not opinion. I mean. People tend to have strong opinion on that. I don't. I don't care too much. But yeah, be ready to see boss. I will say like the as of the per family or the base R function. I think boss exists. And you know, I actually have another question too, which is, um, you know, a lot of these the exercises basically you end up um, passing an index to yeah. to map and then using that. And bait like identically to how a f like to the structure of a for loop, and I, I do wonder like what's the advantage of map? I think, you know, I've kind of heard that it has performance advantages, which I guess makes sense if it's you know if it's vectorized. And I I don't know is it, I don't know how true that is. Um, uh, this is this is a question for like computer scientists. Yeah, is, yeah. I think this is a good question. People tend to have like also strong opinion on that. Um, I. Basically, R function more with vectorized style, so it's work well with the map apply stuff. Yeah, but it does not mean like you shouldn't use for loop when you think it's the correct way of solving the problem or just the one that came very fast to you. you know, sometimes yeah. there's value into that also. Um, but um, I do. There's a piece of the book, uh, the the Hadley Wickham Advanced R book that talks about kind of the. Um, uh status of for loops in r and how they're kind of uh uh you know d uh disfavored um and i i should look at that because i i think i've always tried to use map because i thought it had performance benefits but i think it only does in some cases and not all but um yeah exactly. so it's kind of an on it's also like when you are working in one paradigm should we enforce this paradigm or not this is a good like yeah this is also like a general like question yeah uh i'm not sure how it worked behind the scenes probably a, a granted for loop in c but um there is a mm. question like what's it's evaluated ev evaluated when when you do a for loop uh it's evaluated step by step so let's say like you do something step one is going to be evaluated step two is going to be evaluated i'm not sure into a map function or it's going to be evaluated yeah I, I don't think yeah i think it's simultaneous or Maybe not so, simultaneous, yeah. Because I, of the way the evaluation work in R, the stuff like that. Yeah, like, you know, the, the whole ecosystem is supposed to work better in that way, but I'm not sure mm -hmm. exactly why. <laughs> yeah. So I'm kind and of there is to like, this um uh like have you seen the fur package? Yeah. The uh, yeah, so that's like allows you to parallelize across multiple uh cores. And so that's like obviously faster. So some I mean, I guess that's one advantage, but um yeah, I don't know. I think I think it's a good question of like maybe sometimes we should just use four loops um, it, just because it, they are more good understandable. Good practice to to try to you apply a map, but sometimes yeah. if you have a for loop, use a for loop. Like who cares? Except um, if it's, if it, if you really like running into some timing issue. Yeah, and all uh, make your code less readable. I think what I value more like 
more and more and more is like if the map function met my car my like it's also the default of the for loop is it's kind of in it puts you in an imperative way of um mm. coding because like um a loop with something is down then something is down which can benefit from what have been up so this is interesting in some cases but in some cases you want like a clean mm -hmm. function yeah so you can reuse your clean function in another way so this is like like there's value i mean there's the operation that you are doing mm -hmm. i feel but then there is value outside of it if it's like in the overall program like Maybe on the script, it does not matter on the task, on the simple task. But if the yeah. task is linked to a program, you know, the function you are going to use, maybe you are going to use in another place. So this is like, uh, I don't know. I, I think most of the value is probably outside of just like doing the operation one. If you do the mm -hmm. operation one, I think, who cares? Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. But um, So yeah, to, to follow up on that, I guess a lot of the exercises the second half of the exercises have to do with iterating over index indices to especially to do like rolling yeah. uh versions of functions so i got i don't know the first one's all rolling mean i think so I'll, I'll show that next but if i think if you ever actually have to do that you should there's this function in the zoo package called roll apply which does the same thing but uh in a cleaner yeah. cleaner way um but so here's the first example you just had to uh this function and so i think this the, the reason he put this in here was to like introduce this idea so that then you could be in the space mentally to do the later exercises. Um, but this the, uh, the goal of this function is just to create a list uh, of uh, uh, like a, like rolling windows onto a vector, basically. So you see you have one, two, three, two, three, four, three, four, five, four, five, six, or so every window is one, uh, is in, uh, in iterated one higher uh, along the length of the the vector. So that's uh, one way. To, and this, so the way to do that basically is just to uh, use the index itself as the uh, uh, vectorized argument in the map, uh, in this case, in sequence, because you want to create sequences. Um, and you and the, the index doesn't go all the way to the end. It goes to the uh, last. last element that is the at the beginning of a window. So in this case, you want it to end at four. Um, yeah. Okay. There is so, case where you want the any, but yeah, it exists. It's called. Wait. Uh, sorry. Yeah, what was that? The... There is case like especially like in two D world, uh, as an image or like and where you want like the border, with any. Oh right. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. But why not? Like this is yeah. Yeah. Great, great exercise. This, um, this one is funny to me because it's like, it looks a lot like setting up. A a loop like yeah. you're mm -hmm. indexing and going through it. so that I, I thought that was amusing yeah i think all of these have that or m not all of them but most of them have that character um which is is interesting so it did that was why i was running like ah, why don't we just do a loop for this but um i mean this one is pretty efficient if you have to do it for with a loop now it will be less efficient yeah. you will need to write way more code that's uh if you did this one with a for loop um yeah. Yeah, I, I guess that's true. Yeah. Because the L apply you will need for like a we mm -hmm. need to loop for over like the number of gram, the the n gram you want. You need to loop for one n gram, two n gram, two, two grams, yeah. three gram. Where here like you could yeah. do it, yeah. That's a good point. That's I don't know. Uh, this is, I have not written it into loop, but that's my primary feeling. Yeah. Um but so yeah, this is the same deal although in this case you don't you're not using the indices you're using the yeah. uh the length of the individual uh character vector uh, so that's where the end the end car yes here comes it. yeah um okay so, so this is like kind of, of the oh sorry what you have done all of them nearly <laughs> oh yeah i did i i didn't do all of them i didn't do uh the one where you had to do your own version of split oh yeah, my god i didn't do that one um and I didn't do the the one where you, it wanted you to write the versions of the Pareto distribution to write the yeah I didn't, I didn't want to do that yeah. that's um, the similar exercise yeah they feel uh, they feel very coding question yeah yeah, you yeah. Know, if if you prepare like for a in technical interview uh, from our position I could see myself doing all of them <laughs> go yeah I I think that's a good that's kind of why I'm uh, I'm 
eager to do these a little bit as I, I, and there's so much more pleasant to do in some ways than my like actual work. Cause they're so clean and self-contained, you know, like yes. they, uh, yeah. So I don't know. I, but anyhow, so this, this uh, exercise, some point one to, is it implementation basically of that role apply, uh, function. Um, so we're, we're applying the, in this case, the rolling mean to a vector. And so you can see like what that means, like, uh, maybe for the benefit yeah, of the no, YouTube is that in this case yeah. that we're doing the mean of the first three uh, elements of the vector. So one, three, five, then we're doing the mean of the uh, second through fourth elements. So three, five, 10, and so on and so forth until we, we've covered the whole vector. So that's what a rolling mean is. So in this case, we are, our inputs allow us to pass a function, uh, an object, and then the, the length of the, the rolling window. Um, and let me see, is there anything to note? I mean, in this case, and I don't know, maybe there's a more efficient way to do this. I had to, I had to use two uh, versions of the apply function. The first one to create the windows in the same way that I did, you know, kind of like uh, in in this slide. I, and then the second the one to apply the, the second uh, use applies the uh, given function to the to the windows. Um, I, I, I would have done something similar, like a bu mm -hmm. first building the, the windows, then uh, yeah. mapping over it, but that's no worries. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that was the only way where I could think to do that. Um, okay. So I'm moving, I'm moving on. I'm moving past this for, for now, although I'll circle back because we still have a lot of time. So I, I, uh, yeah. I'll, we can go through the rest of the exercises. Um, so the last part of the chapter had to do with packages and libraries. And I think we probably mostly know this as well. Although some of it actually was helpful because I, I mostly use automated ways to manage these. And so it's good to kind of get into the nuts and bolts a little bit. But um, so CRAN, and I don't know what CRAN stands for, but it's uh, kind of this large uh, maintained repository of R packages. Uh, and so um, it hosts many thousands of R packages and they can be installed with the install.packages function, which defaults to CRAN is the as the repository where it installs from, uh, and then if you want to add them to our environment, um, which technically means adding them to the search path, I guess for ours uh, our search path for uh, commands, you can use the library function. And if you want to know which uh, paths, which library paths your uh, are kind of your current environment is looking at, you can use this libpaths function. Um, and so I guess we'll cover the, I think he covers building from source and also just uh, maintaining like kind of like project specific uh, package library. So uh, sometimes you might need to build a package from a source if it's not available on CRAN, if it's just on GitHub or whatever. Um, and so that is exercise 7.10. He gives some example code in the book of how to uh, install a package that's uh, on the internet as a zip file. But this is if you want to clone a GitHub uh, or, or any Git repo, I guess, and uh, and install as a package. So uh, you use this library called Git2R, which allows you to clone a GitHub repo to a temporary directory and then install it and then make sure to delete it afterwards so that it's not cluttering up yeah, your... Uh... Like currently everyone uses remote uh, install GitHub. I don't know like the, the right, yeah. package that do that. But that's exactly like nearly the same uh, workflow. Um, yeah. Like when I started, there is no option. So we needed to do like this install package from source. So you need to install the package, turn on the package that... the computer, mm -hmm. then use the, and targeting the correct place. This was like, yeah, long time ago. No, hopefully. But it's still good to, I mean, one good point uh, of doing that is because like I think it makes you think what the difference between the runtime where the package will run mm -hmm. that's produced mm -hmm. the binary. And when you load the package, it usually load the binaries that we have produced by uh, installing it. So mm -hmm. when you install the package from source, it's gonna run something and maybe produce the binary or maybe not. And then when you are loading it, you are loading the package as the version that you have installed it. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And that's when you work on developing package, there's a lot of, uh, like, you need to be aware, like, when was the runtime? Wait, I'm update this oh, function. Yeah. So th this is, like, a good exercise for that. And also, like, it's sure, like, you don't need remote or everything like that. You can just clone it and and, mm -hmm. and source it from the, the file. Yeah. And actually, I very rarely um, 
I almost always just use CRAN versions of, of packages. So I, I uh, you, you can work for yeah. a company like this, my case, that have a lot of in, in-house package. Ah, uh, okay. Interesting. And okay. then uh, you don't want to submit them to CRAN because like mo- they are yeah. not public by definition. I mean, they are yeah. like stuff that you want to keep for your, I mean, the company need to keep it as a like for mm-hmm. her or like for, for like some, some reason. So then, uh, but you, and, and you have them in the private repo on GitHub, not a, not a public repo. So in this case, like you are, um, yeah, you are cloning it from the repo and uh, you, you can use remote too. You just need to have a GitHub, uh, mm-hmm. but token, but yeah, there is also a workflow, but yeah, Cran is great. Cyrano. I don't know people pronounce yeah, it. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know what to call. <laughs> um but uh yeah it's it's also like a check the reverse dependency of the package so it's kind of like uh, it, it maintain it's not like um it's not just a forge it's also like a curated forge so it, it's not mm-hmm. just during the pack it's also provide you binary if you are on windows or mac mm-hmm. uh the people from siran are producing the binary of the package so when you install the package you get the binary directory it's way faster than doing it from source <laughs> And this is, you know, this is something I've been trying. There's also the, a list of, uh, like, Posit has its own uh, yeah. package repositories that, so I don't know. I And I I, I I don't know if they have more sometimes in CRAN or, or more um, uh, more versions going back in time. And also if you're just using Linux, like I, I uh, am using Linux on this computer and, and you, you always have to install from source, which sucks because it, it just takes, I mean, you, can use you know, that 10 to- times longer. Yeah, or so the, that that's an all to that, you or the the stuff of uh, of posit, mm-hmm. like like this is like the ideology of open source. Like binary is not open by definition because you need to know yeah. it was compiled, and uh, and you and you need. But like if you have pull source, then you can comp- use the compiler to compile it, mm-hmm. and then um, and then that's it. Yeah, that's why like yeah. a lot of people want to have the source so they can inspect and modify. And if you just have the binary, well, it's it's less transparent. Yeah, but it's a pain though to to install from source because it does it, it can take like a long time. Yeah, um, I, I'm like on, on my Linux box, I have like a, yeah. I installed the informer to you. Oh, pause it, manager. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, because it, it, yeah. So they have binaries for Linux, basically. Yeah. Um. Uh. So. Just another note here, I guess, is that you can create a project-specific package libraries um, using the rinviron dot file, yeah. so dot rinviron, and you can set a project-specific r user lib variable, and you yeah. can actually set other project-specific variables too if you. Uh, uh, yeah, the the the, the complex the complicated stuff is like the i r the dot r environments into your project supersede your prof yeah. your person yeah. your users one so if yeah. you have in your user one like some set some a lead pass specific to the project mm-hmm. uh it will supersede the the like yeah the order yeah. operation matters like the air environments from yourself go into lower position than the air from the project which is good yeah. but like it can be tricky when you are building shiny apps that refer to our environments and spe- uh, uh and uh-huh. it's not passed. So there's tricky moment. Uh, well, mo- mostly in the engineering part. Like if you are working on that analysis, it does not bother too much. But Interesting. yeah, um, all the package manager like ROM and stuff like that use this kind of lead pass. Yeah, and and so that like is uh, the help file. This the help file for startup covers that yeah. a little bit. Where it, it does it it go it starts. Uh, it first looks for an R environ file in the project level directory and then in the user level and then in the system level. I think. And you have the profile also that's loaded that could. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so, yeah, that's- yeah, that's a good point. You have to be careful. Like, if you, you don't want to have things that you want in your system level, but then have a separate project level one that doesn't have that. So, yeah, I, I guess it can get. Yeah, the, the, the book package, um, the book from Wicam and Jenny Brian, like the, the air package is very good on the south hmm. and everything like that. The, I don't know that. I don't know that book. What's it called? I can write it. Like it's have a book. Oh, okay. so. <laughs> oh, it has its own. Oh, okay. Oh, it's the one that Emma's going to do or. Uh... Yeah, I don't know. It's some, someone oh. already like restarting doing it if you want to oh, join. But okay. yeah. Yeah. I, 
I did. I was gonna join it, but then they said a lot of time that I just like can't really. Uh, but it's yeah. On that, it's a very good book. On that, I think it's very well illustrated and and easy to read. Um, sorry, I keep looking away. Our 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 two cats are getting ready to That's fine, fight no. each other. Do I need to come intervene? <laughs> no. Um. Uh. So yeah, this is just an example. So you you can. Uh oh. Yeah, it was an exercise. Uh, yeah. Uh yeah. So this is just uh you can change the .r environment file. Uh, from your kind of uh, at the operating system level using a text editor or whatever, or you can uh, you can do it from within R2 uh, using the system two uh, yeah. uh, function, which allows you to call bash yeah. uh, from or, or R. if you're on Windows, your WSL. Oh right, okay, yeah. So no yeah, this only two. I think this only works for Unix like oh system two maybe I don't know I think system work on bus. I, I don't know what's the status of both this 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 culture okay. system, but yeah, usually they should they should they, they, they should be designed so they could interact also with the Windows um, shell environment. Mm -hmm. But I'm not a uh, Windows user, so I can't say. Yeah, no, I'm not. Yeah, I don't know. And uh, yeah, I don't know uh, uh, Power you, Shell or whatever the Windows you one is. So can yeah, you can you can yeah yeah. Um, yeah. And so I think the rest of these sayings were just uh, these were exercises that I thought were like a little harder. Oh my god! Yeah. Um, and so I was wondering, you know, if anyone had any I thoughts have not on these to do this week, but I will probably go go back to them. Yeah. So this one, you know, I I think all of these I got solutions for, but I I just felt like maybe they weren't the best. Um, so this one was to extend the base duplicated function. So duplicated. Yeah right now just tells you if something's duplicated, whereas the, first the one, extension, yeah. yep, extension tells you how many times a uh, uh, given uh, uh, element has been duplicated. And so the way I kind of tackled it was to use two, uh, yeah. two different uh, uh, apply functions. And okay. so the first one is, um, and I'm trying to remember what I was attempting to do here. Um, so it's a grip. Um... Uh, so yeah, so this so this uh, creates a list that has all that has all the um, same occurrences of each element smooshed together in each uh, element of the list. So like um, the first element of the list will be all the numbers, you know, all of the ones, and the second element will be all the twos. Uh, and then the second thing is an index, which tells, so the second thing, the thing I named indices is, uh, is an index, which says basically where all those things came from originally. Yeah. And so then, uh, I just it's kind of a, a for loop. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Kind of a for it. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So just, uh, I index the, way of doing it. I don't know. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't know. So, uh, I struggled, but it does work. Uh, it does. I, I guess it's I didn't, work, put, so it's good. I didn't put the output uh on the slide i guess but it does it does work um what is this here um oh it's uh oh it's this it's it's this exercise i i didn't um it's not that i didn't necessarily understand the instructions but i was having a hard time understanding the the value of the exercise um and so i don't know and if, if you haven't done this no it, I it'll be do it. it'll be hard for me to explain because it, it uh uh yeah it's just a, a difficult um set of instructions to parse maybe less than the actual technical details but uh i, I yeah i don't know so basically the instructions are, so yeah it, it's it. it's unusual um come back but i was trying to figure out you know i plotted the results and i was trying to understand why uh why he had even given us these, these instructions um i thought maybe it was like an implementation of the sample function Maybe, but I actually don't think it is. So I, I don't know. I think Maybe it's he more can... like a random work, but yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and then this uh, final example that I'm including is uh, an illustration of the idea that some R functions actually return functions. Yeah. Um, so this case, the, uh, the example you have here is the spline fun function. Uh, so yeah, if, if you, yeah, there's plenty of them that do that. Yeah. And, and a lot of them, a lot of functions are like that, but yeah, so you, and, and so it's really, it's useful. So in this case, you're, 
uh, fitting a spline to X and Y, and then you're using that spline to predict new yeah. values for Z. Um, and so, yeah, spline fit, and then you take the uh, function, which is now kind of in the in the object spline fit, and apply it to Z. And actually, if you do that, it kind of works. It, uh, you see the gray is the original spline, and then the the uh, blue bluish gray is the predicted the, the new predicted values for Z. Um, yeah. yeah. I think that's, uh, that. I mean, I think yeah, this is also like a good point. Uh, I mean, this is also like an. I mean, for me. Uh, even if I know they do that, uh, I did not perceive the value of it uh, before correctly reading these chapters. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I yeah I, I didn't actually know about the spline fun function. Uh, uh, I had, just I, the, like having a function that returns a function. Like yeah, Adley we can mention it a lot. Like in in when you mention like the yeah the work, work, um, I don't know you call that like factory for function. Fact, so yeah, for, yeah. For this function. Well, well. Oh, are you good? <laughs> There's a uh, yeah. Maybe I should uh, check check on. Well, I guess I was gonna check on them. Um, yeah, but, they're they're further fighting, I think. So. But um, uh, yeah, so that that was like uh, I I didn't realize how useful they could be, and I think this this was good word for me. Yeah. Um. And let's see. Let me see if I can pull up my answers. Yeah. To the, I mean, to most the other... of them were easy. most of them were easy. Yeah. But some, like for example, uh, a function uh, return to uh, object. I think to me, I think I I don't know if this is the right way, but I, I think you just have to put them in a list and have it yeah, return a list. That's my answer too. But is that's it, the is only. Object? Yeah, that's the only thing. Um, that's the only way I know how to do that. Um, for the rest of it, they're kind of like. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the key. For the for I guess this is exercise seven point eleven. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean we covered some of it, like the do call you can use yeah. to call functions dynamically. Uh, um, I agree, like for me, a function can only return one object. If you need to return to object, it needs to be in the list. Yeah. But I haven't like I, explored that too much. I don't know any other way to do that. Um the, the and maybe if you're returning multiple objects, maybe you I guess you could also use an attribute. I guess a lot of functions do that where yeah. you, yeah. if you, but um, then you need to access the attribute source. Yeah. Then it's more, yeah. Then it's, yeah. Um, yeah. And the set of package you address it. Uh, the yeah. Database. And the, and the key thing about uh, the map uh, function is the, that you have some arguments that are vectorized. And then if you want additional yeah. non-vectorized arguments, you put them in the more args under the more yeah. args parameter. Um, yeah, some of these I did like there was the exercise um 7.12 was he just wanted us to implement uh a this version of the genie uh index. And I actually couldn't, I actually am not sure that the formula in the book is right for the genie index. I can ask on GitHub then. Oh, I don't know. I, I, I I'm but because you know there's I I you know I'm not good enough at like formal math to manipulate the, the genie index formula, but I I'm don't think it's right. And I did try it and I got different results than if I I will I will check them. Let me yeah. see. But if you if you so do figure you, out you're if, you are doing the flow of ex I'm I'm doing nothing. Yeah, uh, because I was checking like before uh going like who's presenting next week, but Emma claim it. Oh. Well, do you want to do nine? You can do nine if you want. And then we do nine. Do... Okay. Apparently nine is big. So yes. yeah. yeah. Originally signed up for nine, and then I backed off and uh, took next week. Okay. Um, so but for nine, nine maybe you shouldn't do. Oh, 